With this simple statement, Dr. Norman Borlaug reminded us that the fungal microorganisms that cause the devastating rust diseases of wheat are a dynamic threat, capable of evolving novel forms of virulence and overcoming many of the genetic mechanisms of resistance bred into our most advanced varieties. Recent examples include the emergence and rapid spread of the UG99 group of stem rust races, as well as a number of broadly virulent and aggressive races of stripe rust. As we strive to develop strategies of durable resistance to the wheat rust, it's important to consider how new and destructive races emerge in the first place. It's important to understand how wheat rusts evolve. Let's use stem rust as an example. When a wheat variety carrying stem rust resistance genes is grown, particularly on a large scale, its presence affects the population of stem rust in the field. Races virulent on the deployed resistance genes thrive and multiply, while avirulent races decrease in frequency. In this process of human-guided evolution, it must be understood that resistant varieties do not create new virulence in a pathogen. They select for it. But for such selection to take place, variation must first exist within the pathogen population. Where does it come from? In a series of experiments in the mid-1860s, Heinrich Anton de Berry, one of the founding fathers of modern plant pathology, demonstrated that the stem rust pathogen, Puccinia graminus, completes only part of its life cycle on cereal hosts like wheat. As shown in detail in the short film The Life Cycle of Wheat Stem Rust, the pathogen completes other parts of its life cycle only on alternate hosts, which include certain species of plants from the genus Berberus commonly called barberries. It is during the barberry-hosted phase of its life cycle that the stem rust pathogen undergoes sexual recombination. And as it turns out, barberries also serve as an alternate host for the wheat stripe rust pathogen, Puccinia striiformis. The sexual recombination of genetic material presents a powerful mechanism for the creation of new virulence within the wheat rusts. So although the barberry-hosted phases of the wheat rust life cycles are often obscure, it is important to understand them in order to develop better disease management strategies. Monitoring the barberry hosts of stem and stripe rust in wheat growing regions around the world is therefore vital to our ongoing global rust surveillance work. This instructional video on isolating wheat stem and stripe rust from barberry species is intended as a reference for those researchers interested in contributing to this effort. Now, to determine the role local populations of barberry may play in the emergence of new races of wheat stem and stripe rust, two significant challenges must be overcome. First, relevant populations of the alternate host must be located. And second, Eseal infections found on plants within those populations must be carefully processed to determine if indeed they are the result of cereal rust infection, and if so, which cereal host they specialize on. We will address each of these challenges in turn. Where should we look for alternate hosts? Recall from the pathogen life cycle that the only spore that can infect the barberry host group is the basidiospore. Relatively small and thin-walled, basidiospores are prone to rapid desiccation in many environments and are therefore believed to remain viable only over short dispersal distances. Thus, one is unlikely to find cereal rust infection on barberry plants growing 10 or more kilometers from cereal hosts. This is a general requirement of proximity that can help prioritize surveillance efforts. Once you've decided where to look, how do you identify potential alternate hosts? Barberries are woody, perennial shrubs comprising a highly diverse genus with over 400 described species, known in many regions of the world for their food, medicinal, and ornamental uses. Some barberries are deciduous, while others are evergreen. Leaf and flower morphology, plant height and growth habit, physiology and habitat vary substantially within the genus. Such diversity translates into notable differences in the likelihood that a species will host cereal rust pathogens and makes it very difficult to characterize the barberries in a general way. Here, we will focus on only a couple of species as examples. If you wish to conduct barberry surveys in your area, 
you will likely find it helpful to work with local botanists to learn the characteristics of the species growing in your region. The European or common barberry, now naturalized to many parts of the world, is a dense deciduous shrub that can reach a height of up to four meters. Its oval leaves have a serrated margin and grow in clusters of two to five, subtended by a three or more branch spine. Though differing in its characteristic length from species to species, this spine is a common morphological trait among many barberry species and so can be a valuable feature in terms of genus identification. The small, yellow, cup-like flowers of common barberry are produced on panicles in late spring, followed by clusters of oblong red berries that appear in late summer or autumn. Because of the role it plays in the life cycle of wheat stem rust, common barberry has been the target of extensive eradication efforts for centuries. In East Africa, the region where the virulent UG99 race group emerged, there grows a native evergreen barberry species known as Berberus holstii, also known to be susceptible to wheat stem and stripe rust. Berberus holstii is commonly found in highland environments suitable for wheat production. Subtending each group of spiky leaves is a prominent three-branch spine, and the small flowers are yellow like those of common barberry, but the fruit of this species is a deep bluish purple when ripe. Again, there is great morphological diversity within the Berberus genus. Some have no serration at all, while others are difficult to handle due to their sharp points. The leaf shape of this species, distributed in parts of China, is almost linear, while this one, present in parts of the Himalayas, has ovate leaves. It is also worth mentioning plants of the genus Mahonia, a genus related to barberries, with some species susceptible to wheat stem rust. Using local botanical knowledge and an understanding of the pathogen life cycle, it is possible to define the barberry species and the geographic areas of interest for your stem and stripe rust surveillance efforts. And by following the methods described next, rust isolates can be retrieved from barberry leaves and fruits and characterized through carefully conducted inoculations. Barberry plants are hosts of several different rust fungi, not just cereal rusts. For some, they serve as uridineal hosts, while for others, like wheat stem and stripe rust, they are esial hosts. It is important, therefore, to be able to distinguish esia from uridinia or telia on these plants. While esial pustules rupture primarily through the lower leaf epidermis, please note that esia may also be found on the barberry fruits, as shown here so it is important to examine not only leaves but flowers and berries as well when making collections. A single esial pustule contains many individual esial horns, which for the cereal rusts are long and trumpet-like in shape. When young, the esial horns can be a vibrant orange or yellow-orange color. Thousands of esiospores are formed within these structures, and these spores and mass appear as an orange-yellow powder. Both the esial structures and the spores are of interest for collections. When collecting, look for plant tissue with active, sporulating esia and be sure to record the location and barberry species for each collection site. This information will remain with the collection as passport data into the future. It is important to collect the tissues into a type of bag that will not promote condensation. Glassine or paper bags work well. Avoid plastic bags. Drying the tissues at room temperature will help preserve the fungal structures and spores for transport and storage. Do not expose the collections to extreme temperatures or allow them to hydrate. For storage periods longer than a week, the tissues should be kept in a dry place at 4 to 8 degrees Celsius. When making collections from the esial host, Avoid contact with the uridineal host to reduce the potential for contamination. Plan activities well so that barberry and cereal host collections are separated in time and space as much as possible. To determine if esia found on barberries are due to infection by a cereal rust, it is necessary to move to a controlled environment, 
and use the ejected Esiospores to inoculate susceptible genotypes from a range of cereal crop species and look for compatible reactions. An example set of genotypes is shown here. Unlike differential sets used for race identification, the specific genotypes used in this host identification assay are not that critical. The various cereal species should be represented, wheat, rye, barley, and oat, and the chosen genotypes should be broadly susceptible to stem rust. In this set, the three wheat lines are susceptible to stripe rust as well. To prepare one replication of this assay, we recommend that two small pots be filled with high-quality potting mix containing slow-release fertilizer. Plant four entries in each pot with five seeds per entry, that is, five seeds in each hole. Using labels or pot tags or some other system, it is critical to keep track of the locations of the genotypes in the pots. Once the seeds are sown, maintain adequate soil moisture to promote germination and unstressed seedling growth. We recommend placing the pots in a shallow tray of water rather than watering from above. Choosing where to grow the plants is a critical decision because they must be isolated from all ambient sources of cereal rust inoculum. This may be achieved in a clean, dedicated pathology greenhouse, or pots may simply be kept indoors, either by a window or under diurnal grow lights. Conducting the study in a region far from infected wheat fields is ideal. The seedlings will be ready for inoculation once the first leaf has fully expanded, about 7 to 10 days after sowing. To inoculate one replication of the assay, lay the two pots down inside a small tub such that the leaves intermingle, like this. Lightly mist the leaves with a dilute solution of tween 20, just enough to see water beading on the leaf surfaces. Then fit a metal screen over the top of the tub and arrange your collected and dried or freshly collected barberry leaves, easy aside down. Alternatively, you can arrange the leaves first and then put the screen in place. Pack the leaves together densely when arranging them on the screen. If you have more barberry leaves than can fit on one set of the eight serial genotypes, simply prepare more sets of the assay and distribute the collected barberry leaves among them. No matter how many sets you use, it is critical to run at least one negative control, simply a replication with no barberry leaves. Such a negative control is necessary to rule out the possibility of rust infection occurring due to the presence of ambient sources of inoculum. Once everything is in position, lightly mist the barberry leaves with the tween 20 mixture, lay a paper towel over them and dampen it with water, making sure not to disturb the leaves or flip them over. For the negative control, mist the plants again and place a damp paper towel over the metal screen. Move the prepared tubs carefully into a dark room temperature chamber where high humidity can be maintained. Such a chamber can be as simple as individual tied off plastic bags in a dark room or as sophisticated as a dew chamber. To promote the germination of stripe rust esiospores, the temperature of the chamber should be cooler between 12 and 15 degrees Celsius. After 24 hours, the plastic bag or chamber should be opened, the screen removed, and the pots turned so that the seedlings that were originally lying on the bottom of the tub are now on top. If the collected Esia are fresh and the barberry tissues were handled correctly, you should see ejected Esiospores on the surfaces of the seedlings' leaves. Also, if the humidity has been maintained well, you should notice standing beads of moisture on the leaves. After turning the pots, replace the metal screen with the barberry leaves and damp paper towel back on the tub, wet everything down, and place the whole apparatus back in the plastic bag or dew chamber for another 24 hours. Following this second 24-hour period, remove the pots from the tub, place them upright, and lightly mist them with water, making sure not to wash off the esiospores that have landed on the leaves. If using a plastic bag, place the bag over the plants, tent-like, with an open bottom, to facilitate a slow dry down. If using a dew chamber, place the upright plants back in the chamber, but leave the door open. 
After three to four hours, the bag may be removed entirely, or the tubs may be removed entirely from the dew chamber, and the plants maintained normally with adequate soil moisture. To facilitate the infection of stem rust esiospores, the upright plants should be maintained at near room temperature. To facilitate the infection of stripe rust esiospores, they should be placed in diurnal conditions with cool night temperatures. Indirect sunlight is adequate for this stage. At 10 days after inoculation, start conducting daily inspections of all seedlings for symptoms of rust infection. Careful notes should be taken recording both the genotypes and the days post-inoculation for all pustules found. The negative control should be closely monitored for infection. If any pustules are found on the negative control, the entire experiment should be stopped and repeated in a more isolated location. If the negative control is clean, allow pustules from the other assays to develop for three to four days and then harvest the uridinia spores from all pustules, keeping the collected spores separated by plant genotype. In other words, all spores collected from pustules on wheat genotype line E should be kept separate from spores collected on wheat genotype Morocco, and so forth. Alternatively, you may elect to conduct single pustule isolations at this stage. To create isolates for race identification, use the bulk collected spores to inoculate new seedlings of the same genotype. In other words, uridinia spores collected from genotype line E should be used to inoculate new seedlings of line E. Although the primary purpose of this inoculation is to produce isolated pustules for subsequent race analysis, we recommend including the eight serial genotypes in this inoculation as well to provide more information on the forma specialis of the collected uridinia spores. Resulting pustules from this inoculation should be isolated, increased, and pathotyped according to the procedure for the isolation and identification of rust races collected from wheat fields. These activities are described in detail in the series of race analysis training videos produced for the Borlaug Global Rust Initiative. Effective monitoring of the alternate hosts of the wheat rust is an important part of the ongoing global effort to manage these serious diseases. With better site-specific knowledge of the life cycles of these devastating pathogens, the hope is that opportunities may emerge to slow the evolution of wheat stem and stripe rust. Whether through targeted barberry eradication programs, modified timing or location of wheat production, or other strategies that only an improved understanding can reveal, we may discover ways to extend the usefulness of our deployed resistance genes. Thank you for your interest in contributing to this work by conducting surveys in your region. If you have questions about how to proceed, please contact us.